Hey, it's the Chief. Bonnie with Board Games is Hamtack. Hamtack, hey. we're back. <laughs> See, there we go. You bet. I went and watched a couple of those last ones where you guys would simultaneously yell Hamtack. Phenomenal. So today, we're doing top five air war games. And you explain this way better. I always trip over it. I love the way you explain it because you get in a low atmosphere. Or... Well, okay. So to me, when I, when I heard the air war games, it was going to be anything after 1903, but before space wars because there's no air out there anything between there and you'll see that i've got some games that may not fit the normal mold of what an air war game is but anything where combat in the air is the focus so that's what i that's the way i picked it beautiful that's what we did also you may hear some kids in the background <laughs> so one wants to come down here real bad and i said no yeah or it could just be Judd. Yes. <laughs> Anything's possible. Yeah, my, you know, if you hear some whining or whatever, it could be Judd. Yeah, there you go. The Juddalos are mad. Um, anything you want to throw in uh, before we just start down our list? All right, for those that haven't been here for a while, and it's been quite a while, um, Ham Tag is? Half as, men, half as much, twice as good. Most Perfect. people do top ten lists. We do top five lists, but they're great. That's right. <laughs> twice as good and we're going to start from five and then work down to our number one which is the game that we at least like and the reasons we want to do it right um why don't we just start with you all right with me so my number five air war game it's of course an oldie it is rise of the luftwaffe one of the things about uh air games especially you know just airplane against airplane a lot of them are top view. You get that dimension, but you lose the altitude. Or there are some games coming out now. Um, Wing Leader is one of them. There's a game coming out, out of Italy called Winged Victory. That's another one. That's side view hmm. of World War I airplanes. And uh, so, but when you do that, you know, you kind of lose the deflection and things like that. This is basically up front with airplanes. There's, um, it's the Down in Flame series. There's, I think, six or seven games now in the series, but this was the first in the series. It's 1939 to 1942, so you've got early modern, early model Spitfires, ME 109s, things like that. It's usually um, mostly uh, individual airplanes, dogfights, but there are six campaigns that go everywhere from Poland up to North Africa. Uh, you, you maneuver using cards. Altitude is handled kind of abstractly because you can play a card to gain altitude and you're, you know, you are high, middle, or low, and how you relate to the other airplanes affects what kind of cards you can play and everything like that. You're usually flying with a pilot and a wingman. You've, you've got a, deck of a hand of cards for your pilot and a lesser hand of card for your wingman, but he can still help, may end up getting shot down. But it's just a uh, an enjoyable dogfight game. So that's my number five, Rise of the Luftwaffe. It does 3D space real well, and that is the problem it, with Airborne. It, 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 it's very abstract, but it, it, it treats it, and it treats it in the same detail that it does the deflections and things. What I've always wondered about that is I have Down in Flames, Aces High, mm -hmm. um, DVG games, mm -hmm. and I've always wondered if I got one of those and sleeved the cards, would they be compatible? I figured, figured they had different backs, but I, I've always wondered. I didn't know how I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Somebody can answer in the comments. Yeah. And the, and the only, I played off of this system long ago, there was a, a video interpretation of the game for, for a PC, because it dealt with the the low, middle, high, and you got to spend energy, I think, to gain the altitude, okay. and you pick up at speed. They would play okay. like uh, newsreel footage in between okay. cuts and things, and, okay. uh, but I've never played the physical version. All right, B-17, Flying Fortress, Leader, the Leader Series, DVG. So first of all, I love B-17. I love the B-17. I love the Bomber War. This is strategic level solitaire you're you're managing the the fleets and what you're going to attack and and the, the kind of the grand theme of what 
heavies were doing in World War II. They had to put out a new rule book right away. Um, I've pushed pieces around, I read the rules, I haven't played it fully because the rules were somewhat confusing to me. They got a new PDF of the rules out and people are asking that they put the rules out in a printed form as well. PDF will be fine for me, but you're going to have a lot of people, a lot of people, even DVG like uh, veterans did not like this rule book in here at all. It's scattered, hmm. things are all over the place. There's there's no good glossary to go look something up. I think it's like 40 pages long. It's got an awesome board. The chrome is nice. Tons and tons of cards in here. B-24s, uh, part of, of course, the 8th Air Force. The B-17s, B-17G, uh, all the supporting little friends that'll help you out. and. And, I, and it's there and it's possibility and I've, I haven't even looked at the new PDF. What had happened was I had it out, playing around, looking at it, kind of getting a feel of it, getting confused, loving the concept, but it needs work on the rule book. I think there's a phenomenal game here. I know I'll get it figured out. I, I love the strategic grand level of what it is because some of you, some of you may know, that I've played another B-17 game at some point in my life. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So some people may be aware it may even show up possibly somewhere in this list. Okay, so this is the this is the whole picture of what's going on. And quite honestly, I was extremely excited when it came out. I it's still workable, it's still good. I need to dive back into the PDF rules and and play it in a way that I think is going to be well. Be I'll be able to understand it better and not get frustrated and put it away. So, um, when you know when you say strategic bombing, mm -hmm. how does this uh, compare to like the old Avalon? Are you the old Avalon Hill Luftwaffe? Are you okay. setting targets and sending out raids? Um, you know the the old Luftwaffe. I think I played one time 20, 30 years ago. So this is. You're, you're, you're definitely, you're managing targets that you're gonna attack, and the hope is that some of the targets you attack will lessen what they can put out, ball bearing factories, right. they can't bring right. as many planes to you. But are, um, you, are you planning your targets? Or are the targets, you know, like what I kind of remember about B seven the original B-17 uh, was, you know, the game kind of decided what your right. target was. Right. Yeah, the other leader games I've played is, was you pulled a, you flipped a card and it told you what your target was. Right, Hornet leader, yeah. and I, uh, Thunderbolt. Right, yeah. and I believe, right. I've, I've gone through the cards, I looked, I haven't even played through a proper game of it. So, and that okay. I'm telling you right up front, weak. How, okay. For me, I'm weak. But, what it, it from what I remember reading on here and going through it, you can even set it up for where you're at in the air war because okay. there is the historical version where uh, what they went after the sub pins in uh, like St. Nazarene and all of those were in there mm -hmm. completely ineffective. Um, what did they What did they start off with? Was ball bearings Ball bearings was middle, wasn't it? I can't remember, but they've I've, got the historic path, which I remember thinking that's cool. Then they've got more of a wild thing that's kind of okay. you're dealing with what's coming okay. out. So, but I know there's huge criticism out there on the rule book right now. There is a new PDF for those that are out there. I have not even looked at it yet. Um, I don't need the printed rule book. I can work off the PDF. Literally, I had it out. Love the cards, love the pieces, love the chrome. Frustration ensued. I buy more games than I can play. <laughs> I put it back in the box. But okay. it made my list with all of those okay. caveats. Interesting okay. on the rule book. The I've, theme is is huge for me. I've played the all of, all the field commander games mm -hmm. and uh, about four of the leader games I think. I've never had a problem with Dan's versus rule books. I mean, even like Lightning Midway, which I've heard in one of the better ones. I didn't really have a problem with it, but but I, I don't know. On the Solitaire War Gamers group, I haven't seen this one talked about as much as that. Yeah, I went on the look. Card game or whatever um, it's called. I mean, I'm not. My my deal. I, I got a lot of family kid, little kid stuff going on. I've got the other other show going on with the whiskey reviews, and I. 
quite honestly, as I dove in, I loved it and I'm looking at it and then I start reading over the books and kind of seeing and okay, how's this going to set up? And it didn't feel very intuitive for me. And I thought, well, maybe I'm just not catching it. I mm -hmm. hadn't played any of the leader stuff in a quite, I mean, we're talking years and I thought, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got online just to see what was there. And that's where, I mean, I was reading where other people were having problems with the book okay. too. I was sure it was me. It's apparently not just me. My number five, there's a golden oldie, Ace of Aces. It is 1980 Nova Games, uh, reprinted 2014 Flying Buffalo. Um, this is the game. Two flip books. You take one, hand it to the other guy. Has 223 pages and it shows your view from the cockpit. Um, each page has 25 maneuvers. Really cool system. I pick my maneuver, I, Bart picks his maneuver, I say go to page 150, he says go to page 100. We go to those pages and I look at my maneuver and it'll put us. We'll find a page and like if we're coming at each other this way and we both go straight, the next view will be just like this. I'll see him in my tail and he'll be he'll see me off to his left. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's a game. I don't want to think too hard because I prefer to I, I prefer to believe the magic. Games like <laughs> this and ambush always blew my mind. How did they do this? It blew me away then. Now I'm like, how'd they do it before the age of computers? I've never heard of a typo error in this game. All those pages, all those possibilities. But I was like, how did they? And I don't know. It's and um, Anyways, um, the game is pretty quick. It's almost a filler game, five to ten minutes. Your goal is when you get when you get in the right spot, you'll see you're, you're shooting at the other guy, he'll see you shooting at him, you score points, whether you're close, far, medium, you know, does the amount of points of damage, so many points you go down. Um, there's an advanced game, I'm of the opinion, doesn't, avoid it. Doesn't really hit yeah. that much. Fuel management, right. eh. um, But what was cool was, in the 80s, before the age of the internet, right. before right. Vassal, all mm -hmm. this stuff. Right. My friend Rob and I, he had the um, pow um, powerhouse series. Wait, wait, wait. This is handy. Yeah, I, yeah, he had powerhouse series. We'd call each other up on the phone and play this over the phone. So we were doing, mm -hmm. you know, before, back when play by mail was with a stamp and an envelope. You had like the 30 foot cord. Yeah, no, I had a cordless phone. We were high tech, but you keep in mind this is like '83. Sure, so yeah, yeah we call each other up and play with a paper cup and string. Yeah, that was. <laughs> but we play this over the phone, so we were doing like. We were vassal um, pioneers in this game. Um, really fun game. I think there's like six or seven in the series. I don't know about the others. I only had this one. He had that oh, one. So we was just, that was always you. good enough. Um, but anyways, very fun, quick filler, and it's just got a lot of again. Lot of the only, you know the the lack is it really doesn't do anything about altitude. Yeah. So an airplane that would have that advantage doesn't have that advantage, but. The good thing to know about this is this is still a big tournament at WBC. Oh, that's cool. Because what they do is uh, everybody signs up and you can just find somebody during the convention hmm. and fly two or three missions. And then they have uh, what they call, uh, I don't know if they just call them dogfights or furballs or, but anyway, where they all get together in a room and they'll fly many times. And they, you know, so they recognize each other, passing in the hallway, fight two or three or four times, and then at the end, somebody has the best record. So it's a it's a big thing there, and the the books are, you know, like this is a handy rotary series. <clears throat> I think it's a camel and a Fokker triplane, mm -hmm. and uh, the powerhouse series. I mean, they work together. Yeah. Uh, now I think I think there's some World War II airplanes. I don't think. They work cr yeah, across they did the a jet war, fighter but, too. And, yes, but I don't know about those. Right. Um, but let's see. Oh, as far as cost of the game, I, this one goes for pretty good chunk. But like I said, it was reprinted. Um, I found them in stores. Uh, it always surprised me when I find them in stores. Like, I oh, mean, I thought this thing was you know thirty year old game, long out of print. So you can actually find games in the series for a pretty reasonable price. And I think, like I said, they're still in print. Last one is twenty fourteen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my number five, Ace of Aces. All right, my number four. Get ready. It's a solitaire game. Yay! Yay! London's Burning. It's a solitaire game on the Battle of Britain. Um, there's a lot of Battle of Britain games out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not in any way saying this is the best, but it's the easy, one of the easier ones to access. Um, so what happens in this one is you are the allies and you're you're responding 
to the raid. So you've got to do, you know, you will get reports on where the raid is, and then you decide where, how many airplanes you want to send up, where you want to send them, what altitude you want to send them to, and then, you know, the raid might show up and it's nothing, and the real airplanes are over here. There are some uh, funky ways, you know, you get fog of war, you know, oh, you've, you've, you've heard about this raid and it turns out to be no airplanes. Another thing that happens is the Luftwaffe raid, when it moves, moves randomly. You know, did it really move randomly on the way in? No, but it, it kind of helps portray the fact that I, as the British, don't know where they're going. So Fog uh, of war. Pardon? Fog of war, basically. Right. It's basically a way to get fog of war. And then the, you know, the victory conditions are just how many uh, Allied airplanes get killed and how many targets get bombed versus how many Luftwaffe airplanes get killed. But there's improvements. You know, you, you might change models of airplane. You become an ace, things like that. Um, and there are three scenarios of different lengths, so you can do that. So hmm. it's it's my number four. It's accessible. London's burning. Old Avalon Hill. So it's 1995. That's my number four. I have mine sitting over there. So, because I was out looking at it as well. I never heard of that game. You're yes. killing me, Greg. Yes. First attack sub, then I'll probably be out looking for that one. Well, there you go. It. I got one. <laughs> I got it right over there, too. All right, Thunderbolt Apache Leader. Again, uh, this is GMT's. This is the older version. They got a newer version. And I'll let you talk more on that because uh, <laughs> if, maybe, maybe you know about, I, and I know, sorry, forget. But um, I, I didn't know about yeah. the, sorry, about the newer version until I, I just went on and to go look and see and check a few things because I haven't played this in years, years, years. And uh, what I love about it, again, it's, it's, um, the, the more tactical, whereas my other leader series with the B-17 was strategic, this is much more tactical. I love that I'm really always in the World War II camp. I really, really am. As a kid, I adored World War II. Um, however, I was in the military and I love the A-10 Warthog and the Apache. And you know, when I was 22, you know, the Black Hawk I was in. So I love the tactical nature of what's going on uh, in this game in particular. Uh, the ability to use, um, and I forgot, the Iroquois, I think is the name, where it would actually, it's more of a scout helicopter with a... Oh, the bubble has, on top. Yes, the bubble, yeah. I was gonna call, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it had laser range the finders dome. and video. Yes. Dome, basically. But. And they could hover low and just float that up over the top mm -hmm. of a ridge, and they could literally be the site for everybody, and that's all modeled in here. Um, and it's funny because, well, it's good. None of this ever came to fruition. What you have is our Apache is so powerful that it goes into environments where it can't even be touched and it fires on things from three miles away and nobody even knows it's there. But you get to play out what never happened um, in Thunderbolt Apache Leader and the tacticalness of it is a blast. I was, I was, that, that reminds me, because this I know is, is purely solitaire. Yes. yes. Is there a two player enhancement for B 17? Solitaire as well. Okay. Purely I said just solitaire. Okay. All right. Oh. Okay. My well, number four. <clears throat> Battle of, another Battle of Britain. <laughs> Battle of Britain. <laughs> this one's from 1990. TSR put it out, and get this. The designer is Richard Borg, the memoir dude, Command and Colors. I didn't even know he made any other games until I, until I looked this one up. <laughs> he doesn't need to anymore. It popped up on a pay it forward and I thought, looked up and I was like, oh, Borg, wow, that's kind of cool. Um, the game covers the Battle of Britain. Um, it has plastic in it, but this, for the grog snob, I don't like plastic. It's not that kind of plastic like the little memoir army men in this. The map, it kind of has a look like a like you'd see in a the big command center, and the the um, planes on the stands represent entire flights, whole bunch of squadrons, and you can imagine like how they had the big sticks and push them around. It's that kind of so it's not tactical. I'm moving around. It's showing position on the map, and it has more a little more of an authentic look to it. Um, very clever system in it. You have um, these. Uh, let's see. I wrote them down because I was miss up the name of it. flight groups. And then each 
Well, with that, that you'll have a certain number of flights, usually like three to four, most of them. And each one of those is represented by the little airplane. And then within that, you got stacks of cards that represent the squadrons. And that's how you shuffle them, deal them. The, you'll, the German player will draw missions, pick out so many, assign them to his groups. And um, the British have to react. And when you, when you go into combat, it tells you how many dice you roll. They have the British roundel symbol and the German cross. If you're the Germans, each cross is hits onto you, each round is onto them. Or if you're trying to bomb targets, that's successes. And the um, symbols against you are like anti-aircraft hits. Mo you're, and they're separate dice for each side. And you do have your symbol on your own dice. It just might be one in six chance where you have more of the other guys. But yeah, you can shoot yourself down. I mean, in a way, if not really thinking of it that way. It's more just the net result of the combat. Um, the game, um, you... The, British, the German player has to uh, get nine missions in eight turns successfully to win this game. The British have less forces, but when they get shot down, they can rebuild. They get rebuild points from their cities. So if you're bombing their cities, you're stripping that away. If you hit, if you hit airstrips, they can't get um, flights up into the air. Um, they have a radar line around the edge, and the way they model that into it is the first time the German plane hits that, it must stop m immediately because it's, it's like gives the British player time more time to react. Hmm. The Germans have to manage their fuel in this, but when Germans lose his planes, they're gone for good. So the British are fragile, but they can keep rebuilding. So you're kind of managing these limited resources. Fascinating game, the only downside is it's a bit long and procedural. You know, about nine turns is a lot, but it's supposed to be a campaign. This isn't one little battle. This is the whole, whole kit and caboodle. So, you know, if that's not a problem for you, but it's it's pretty fun. I was real surprised. I'd never even heard of the game. So that's my okay. number uh, four, Battle yeah, of Britain. Four. Have you guys, I know you have because you haven't. Have you heard of that, Greg? What, this? Yeah. I've seen it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. I'd never played it though. I'd found it, I think, I don't know if I found it at a store online, but it was still in the shrink and I I saw it and just grabbed it. Yeah, it is really so easy to learn. Now, I have you either played this so many times that it's beat up? No, I got to pay it forward. Okay, That's what, I thought somebody maybe puts you... a game, you grab it, sure, you put sure. one of yours up. Um, but yeah, it's a, um, it really is easy to learn. You don't, you can skip the basic rules, go straight will, to the advanced. I will work on and it's like for you. five pages <laughs> of rules. Yeah, I have to fix that stress. Yeah, okay. I will stress that Test for you. you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay, my number three. So again, these are some. It's not just the air war. This is Fire in the Sky. This is the uh, Pacific grand strategy in World War II. Uh, you know, there are three, three games I considered on this at this level for this, and that would be Empire of the Sun, of course, Fire in the Sky, and Asia Engulfed. I decided to go with Fire in the Sky it's in some ways it's a little more generic because it's generic air points rather than you know the specific type of airplane that it is um, but what this does is this makes a difference between the fleets that are made up of carriers and their support and the fleets that are in place to do shore bombardments and invasions and so that difference, I think, adds, adds a lot to the game. It takes into account getting air superiority and air supremacy in an area. You know, in, in Empire of the Sun, you know, uh, air units have a two hex zone of influence. Mm -hmm. In this game, it's, it's area movement. So your air impacts an area and then some of the bases are on the border between two or three areas so it doesn't influence in the entire area and then it also makes a difference between deploying your um, forces into the battle and just doing an operational movement to get them into the area so for those for those reasons um, I picked this game all of them are, are good games all of them are long games but this right now is my number three air game fire in the sky um it's from 2005 i'm not even sure whether how hard it is to get i've, I've seen some things that people are hoping for a reprint because it's not as available as it could be it comes out of multi-man publishing 
My number three, fire in the sky. I can tell you how hard it is to get. How hard is it? Our store in Oklahoma City that we're always talking about, the mm -hmm. Game HQ, one of my trips down there, I'm on work, and um, so I get reimbursed for my mileage, so always go there and give them their share. I think share. you went there when you were supposed to be working on a project. No, actually on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they had that game there, and I had heard of a Pacific game made by like a legendary Japanese mm -hmm. designer, and I kept looking at that, and I thought, is that that game? Well, I didn't have a phone. I, you know, I, I didn't even have a um, when was cord, this? Cord, I was very late to the. I got my first. I got my smartphone last year, so I was now, very. See what that phone would have done for. I you. know. So, anyways, I'm sitting there looking at it. And I was like, oh, I've already spent enough money, hundred bucks, whatever. I go back home and I look it up, and I was like, yep. And I that asked them, it. they had the thing for like twenty five dollars down there, and they said you probably could have got it and flipped it around for ninety bucks. Well, yeah. You're and I flipper. just said, and then I didn't even think about I could have called up Game HQ and had them mail it to me and right. brought it over the phone. Right. So it, and they're usually slow to reprint because MMP is really slow with their P five hundred. So if you find one at a secondhand store, snag it. As you were mentioning London's Burning, right. which I have, and I, again, I played about the same time because I was just, I really love this period where everything's in doubt with England. And as you were mentioning it, I'm thinking, well, a lot of the same things are in play, but I was, you were mentioning mechanism, I'm thinking, did I get these confused? So first, let me explain why I got two up here. So I bought the original RAF by John Butterfield long, long ago. Um, it You play from the British side defending against the German airwaves, World War II, coming in and attacking England. Um, and then they came out, I can't remember the year, I want to say like 2009, Decision Games comes out with this version, which is the exact same game as this with you can now place, and it's solitaire, this is a solitaire game, you can now play the reverse, you can play this, so you can play the British, you can play the Germans attacking the island, or you can play it two player. As great as this is, this has never been punched, okay? So it's here to tell you this is what you would see even if you go look for it. I don't even think they show this, this comes in under versions. Um, I've never played this. I loved the idea and I thought, well, that's my chance to go right back in. I've always wondered what it would be like to be playing from the German side. I think I personally like the map in this one better just visually, but I've played on this one. The other one I haven't played on. I'm just looking at it going, it looks confusing as heck. Um, but it's the exact same where you're just trying to fight off the Germans as they come in. But as you were mentioning the fog of war, I immediately went, I, I do not recall what the fog of war in here and how they play where, where they're coming in and invading. And I believe it was abstracted on the charts that's right on the board. But as soon as you said it, I started wishing I'd had better okay. notes on it. Okay. So because immediately I thought, how in the world did they abstract them coming in in the radar usage? It's in there, but I couldn't remember it. So if you know, put it in the comments. Um, because as soon as you mentioned, I thought, boy, I wish I would have had it. And I know why I bought this. I love Ambush. And they even have on here by John Butterfield, designer of Ambush. <laughs> oh, and, and it says designer of Ambush and a guy who likes B-17, so you ought to buy this game. Yeah, oh, okay. you got to get it. You got to have it. You got to have it. <laughs> so, boom. Hold on, let me get that off. It's not confusing. Okay. Well, Mr. Spoiler Alert Killer. Sorry, sorry, I know. <laughs> My number three is Thunderbolt Apache Leader. I told Bart, the reason it's empty at all is because it's on my table at home. I'm having a blast with it and I just really didn't want to take the game up. <laughs> um, still playing it. Um, this is one actually Bart put on my radar on an earlier, I don't remember what the episode was. I think it was, it was uh, Conflicts. Um, Post-World War II? Post-World War II. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. And then it popped up on a pay it forward and I said, well, I knew that DVG had reprinted it. So I went and looked at it and the comments I started seeing was a lot of folks like this one better. I guess the newer version simplified some things and this not really that tough of a game that it needed simplified and just took out some really good parts in it. Well, I don't know exactly you, what they are though. You mentioned, the one thing you did mention that I didn't know 
was that um, the plane and the pilot are now tied, or the aircraft and the pilot are tied together? I don't together. know if they are. I don't okay. know that much about the new one. I, unlike the other leader games I played, Hornet, um, I own Hornet, I used to own Phantom, and I used to own the PNP, I'm sorry, print, print and play, I hate acronyms, um, Corsair Leader. Um, and they had the pilot and the airplane combined. So pilot stress, airplanes down. This one, they're separate, so you maintain the airplane and maintain the pilot, which I think is a big improvement. Plus, the Apaches have two-man crews, so you can one guy's stressed and one guy's not, you can keep shuffling those. Also, the pilots have advantages to play into it. This guy might let you loiter over the area. I think that was a phrase they used. Um, mm -hmm. Over the area, how many turns you can spend over the... Um, one guy might get on cannon attacks, get a bonus. So you can pair them up to try to maximize your mission you're going out for. Um, like a lot of these leader games, you have the campaigns, various levels of difficulty, Iraq, things like that. That's the one I'm playing right now. Um, um, I like this one better than the other leader games. Part of it was, like I said, the management. It seemed, felt, felt richer. The other ones sometimes gets too abstracted, where I, I don't know, and it doesn't do much. a little formulaic sometimes. Yeah, it's kind of like I know, played one. I, that, that's why I got rid of Phantom, because I thought it's just the same game as Hornet, just okay, I'm supposed to be in Vietnam, but I'm doing the same things. Um, but the other thing that I like is when you get over the target zone, the other games have like a square and they're just like, I'm on the outer zone, I'm in the inner zone, I'm over the target area, and each one you fight your way through. This one, it has, for this, it's cards, it's your train. You have seven cards, and the new one, I did look at pictures of it, to just curious what it was. Um, they have hex, hex pieces, kind of like memoir, those thick or command and colors. That's a cool idea. Um, but and you'll you'll put your guys out there and then you know who you're going up against but then it'll say like you're going up against an armor column and then you roll the dice so many times and they'll say this first one might be two tanks this next one's an APC things like this and, and then you you it tells you where to place them how to randomly place them I think you roll the die for each one and um, then you have to tactically battle people some weapons only work in the area you're in or the card if you're in this version and then you move around on the board and then they also have hills and ridges on these cards and if you're coming over one or up to try to see what's over to shoot somebody might pop up because they were staying low and as soon as you popped up and got up in the air then they come out and start firing so there's this random of random element you also do have the random events like the other games you something on the way out something on the way back you have secondary missions in this that you don't have in the other and um, it's more abstracted, lets you get a lot of stuff out of the way while you do all this managing on the tactical map of your primary mission to speed the game up. Um, so it plays quite a bit differently from the other three leaders, and that's why I like it so much better. Um, one of the suggestions I saw was that the new game has a lot better looking components. And if you're wondering how do you beat GMT on components, it's because this game's 1991. Mm -hmm. um, this is before GMT became GMT. <laughs> Uh, the remake of it's 2012. One guy said he takes both of them, he uses the rules from this, the components from the other game. GMT um, likes that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, so yeah, that is my number three Thunderbolt Apache Leader. Now, before you step off that, say what else you suggested they should do in a leader series because I, I, I think that has value. You mean the. You were telling. Oh, my uh, idea? Uh huh. Oh, I wrote. Just to throw it Okay. Out. I wrote Dan Verson on Facebook. I hope I'm pronouncing his name. In I think you're right on. Okay. Asked him if he ever thought about making a Spitfire leader. And Since we're on the RAF mm -hmm. and all the yeah. stuff that's mm -hmm. going on. Because it'd be interesting to try to, and if you can manage your resources, and yeah, your pilots are going to naturally get very stressed, and it will probably affect their, and then um, you can manage your aircraft, and I was hoping you'd do them like this where you're managing separate things, but then also as a cool, I, I said, hey, you ought to put something in there where you can be the Germans manage it and then have two solitaire games in the same box mm -hmm. pick your which size which sounds right like what your RAF, RAF is so but I, which meant the only thing i can think of that might be why he didn't do it but but it the RAF's not done in this type of situation where you're actually because that is perfect the pilots were getting exhausted they were running out of planes the germans were hitting the airfields and then they get frustrated they're almost ready to close the door mm-hmm and they switched to let's go, you know, Hitler calls, let's go get London. 
yeah. and gives him the break. I mean, I I, I think that would be genius. I mean, he, like, he seemed like the idea. Just I don't expect uh, to see any time soon. Making a game probably oh, takes a while. And I mean, right, he's got an awful sure lot of cue. Or maybe he already thought of it. It's like every time I used to write Richard Borgen, oh, hey, make me an American Revolution game. <laughs> Command in Color. It's like, shh, I can't talk about anything. Yes. I know nothing. And then, mm -hmm. boom, they got one out this year. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry. I just thought there was some value on that. Okay, my number two is one scary looking game. This is Fires of Midway. It's by Clash of Arms. Same designer as did uh, the Hell of Stalingrad. Mm. So this is Fires of Midway. And I'll have to admit the first I mean I play uh, Hell of Stalingrad a lot of people like the atmosphere it puts you in but then it just turns into a die roll. Yep. This one here the first time I saw it it was like this this game doesn't look like it makes any sense. So I kind of stayed away from it, but I, I went ahead and tried it, and now I like it a lot. Um, the part that scared me is the game starts with an empty map, and you're you're playing, you know, concentration. You're turning over two cards, picking which one you want to do, but all that does is set up the initial map. Who has the initiative? How many cards you start with? Are there clouds on the map? Are there uh, storms on the map? It just just sets up your so that it kind of randomizes your starting position. From then on, the game turns into it's it's 1942, so it's like of course Battle Midway, Coral Sea, um, things like that, and your care each carrier has uh, squadrons of the historical types of aircraft so you know you've got fire wildcats you've got devastators you've got avengers in some of the later scenarios you got zeros and each of those has their own uh, ability how again it's dice how many dice do you roll but uh so you've got a hand of cards that's so that it enhances what you can do uh, if you're the Wildcats, you can incorporate a thatch weave. If you're the zero, you know, you've got uh, more fuel so you can search a longer time. And so you, you play these cards off against each other, then you roll some dice. The high die uh, gets, to, gets to do his attack. You might, you know, the cap takes out the uh, escorts. And then might be able to still attack the the uh, attacking uh, bombers, dive bombers, or torpedo bombers. There's enough die rolling so that it balances out. You know, there's some games if you got die rolls and there aren't enough rolls, it's a problem. But here, so you got airplane capabilities, and again the the cards that can enhance specific capabilities. And every turn, you've got a choice. You know, am I going to make a? Is this carrier going to make an all-out attack? Or are they going to do some uh, damage control and then send out a limited attack? Just you know, get into a defensive mode this turn, so they'll be able to attack next turn. So it 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 does a really good job of handling your different airplanes. Oh, these these came back. They're damaged. Uh, I can spend some time to repair them but my carrier might get hit before they can take off again. Mm. So it's it's really a cat and mouse game of at the you know a squadron level. Mm. So this is my number 2 air game, Fires of Midway. I had that in our World War II um, Pacific one. And something cool in this it's Come over it's just a little bit. Oh, longer. sorry. I think you slid. Okay. Better. Um Something cool, and it, it feels it wasn't Kickstarter. That's for the Kickstarter time, but or, or early days before it caught on. It felt like a Kickstarter cool bonus. If you've seen the movie The Final Countdown, 1980 or something, Nimitz goes back in time, has a chance to stop Pearl Harbor. They have that in there. The Tomcats are in there. Those kinds, and they're wicked. I mean, it's it's very very lopsided. If you want to fight it, it's in there. But yeah, I love. There's so much management in that game. Just your airplanes, your carriers. What you mm -hmm. know? Are you going to repair your carrier? Are you going to turn it into the wind? What? But it's really. I mean, it's it's a a fairly large footprint. The the carriers, the squadrons that are on the carriers, 
but the mechanics for handling them, you know, and when you send out, you know, from this carrier, you've got to decide, am I going to send escorts or am I going to keep some airplanes back to serve as cap because I'm going to get attacked later. Mm -hmm. They're going to, you know, they're probably going to find me. So, so there's that kind of management. Yeah. Yeah, the, I, I like the cards. I don't know some some may some may not, but they're they're about that big, and they have pretty much all your information with icons, and it's real easy to understand. I mean, the designers even went out and put on BGG uh, uh, Board Game Geek an entire step by step. I'm doing this. I roll these dice. Here's my hit. So it's I mean, you just follow along. You figure the game out real easily. I came out with my own one page. Okay. And you'll find about 40 of my one page how to play games out on Beat Board Game Geek. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to grab this for my number two. All right. Leviathans comes in a Leviathan sized coffin box. Uh, this did not take off. Catalyst put this out, I believe. The whole premise is fanciful and like steampunkish. Oh, little, okay. Yeah, little miniatures that are in here that are really highly detailed. I've got it upside down back here, unfortunately. Um, but um, the whole deal is they they found this stuff that's lighter than air, and their battleships now fly. And I forget what they call everything. They've got these huge backstory. Doesn't matter. This was the main base box. Then they came out with some other little ones for it's French, uh, English. It's um, like weird World War One didn't happen. I think they've got again the backstory is huge. They got a whole like narrative book that's in here. What I liked about the combat is so you've got these huge capital ship kind of flavor things with almost uh, a juggernaut style. I almost see it as like blimps, kind mm -hmm. of how they worked in World War One. And then you've got these target boards, which I can't show you in post. I may throw up the, uh, I'll throw up a picture because you're working off of your fore and your aft, and then your port and starboard, and and when you hit, you've got to see if do you penetrate the hull, and it's almost as if you are. The whole premise is that they've converted these battleships into these flying vessels. So you've got to penetrate the hull. If you do, then what damage do you do? Where, where does it hit on the? On that section of the ship, which can um, reduce your your speed, it can take out guns, and there's a whole menagerie of things. So then it gets a little bit into almost a wooden ship's mm -hmm. Iron Men kind right. of thing. And I love the 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 mash that happened, and it's so visually appealing. Big board, gorgeous miniatures. Uh, it did not take off. This is one I was hoping would would take off with a lot of different um, expansions and it just did so uh scenarios i'm trying to yes they well what they do is they set up they they will give you more they give you all this history on what's going on where you're at and then you can set up uh, this ship and that ship oh you kind of design your own scenario yes you can do that you can just pick up and okay. play or it can tell you put this here and it'll set you up in the okay. corner and there's some cloud things. I and think they had huge plans for this and it's really more of a skirmish game. Okay. So okay. Um, the back history again is great. It's alternate history. So it hit this, <clears throat> it hit a nice spot for me, but I think it was too far out there for most people. So that's my opinion. That's why, and it was expensive. How, how old was that? Ah, I want to say if I'm going to shoot from the hip. Five, head, two, three, I thought. Two, oh, only two or three? Because, uh, you know, steampunk is kind of hot, but it, I guess somehow it just didn't, didn't hit, didn't hit because it seems like it would be aimed at that group, even though that group isn't really into. And, and I right. think that was part of it too. Um, all the layered history that was in there. I mean, even the uh, everything was top-notch production value. Mm -hmm. uh, the narrative books that are in there, um, but it was definitely a war gamer style, and I think war gamers weren't nearly as right. much into the steampunk right. kind of thing. So, okay. But I love the gameplay. It's fun. It's fanciful. It takes a little bit to get into, but once you're in it, the maneuvering is is very. Uh, it was fun and it was exciting. 
Okay. What is this? What are you bringing up? Oh, sure. gee. B17. I'm not sure you ever heard of this game. I have no we idea should, of what you're teach, how to, teach how to play to this sometime. Um, this is 1983 Avalon Hill. Back in the 80s, this was my very favorite of all the Avalon Hill games. I mean, I just thought the whole solitaire thing was so cool. I hadn't seen anything like that. I still do. Yeah. Um, and still, I still love the game. Um, I think I've said before, one time I had, so I had it on Vassal and I had a layover. My flight was delayed, had a little bit of time. So I sent my guys up. They have a, um, got shot down, I was heartbroken. My airplane is called Dream Theater and it was full of <laughs> band members, pre present and former. <laughs> um, this is why you have your own fans. That's right. They love that. That story you put out there is, is fanciful. Um, anyway, the... Um, there's, there's a group on Board Game Geek who coordinates missions. They'll say, we're going to go hit such and such today. Um, I always wanted to put Justin Bieber on my team, put him on the nose gun, and then I'll volunteer to take the front. <laughs> no, my luck, he'd get 25 missions. Um, but anyway, yeah, they, they coordinate these missions, and they fly them. So, I mean, if you still want to play this and get something a little bit more beyond just a solitaire experience. Um, I played this in... Um, my 30 games in 30 days solitaire thing. We've mm -hmm. shot a video on that. Mm -hmm. um, I called that airplane the Legends of Awesome Plus Judd. I was on it, but it was um, like George Washington was pilot and Mark Herman was a waste gunner. Mr. T was belly gunner. Teddy Roosevelt was the a... The belly gunner? He was the, he Mr. Was the T? ball gunner? Yeah. Mr. T was in the ball. Yeah. <laughs> I pity the fool. I had a Tyrannosaurus Rex as a tail gunner because I had that oh, little wow. guy I kept on by all my games. You were hilarious. Yeah, and um, yeah, the, and the funny thing is, is, is the stories you get out of this. That's why I play this game. People have said there's not a lot of decisions other than where you game aim your guns. It's true. It's the best narrative game I've ever played. Um, in that one, Chuck Norris shot down three people and he was the cheat gunner. <laughs> you only hit on a six. And I claim that Chuck would just look out the window and shake his head and they just yeah. right into the ground. And spray fire is way better with your waist gun. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, so the game just generates. We've talked. I've, I've probably been in this a video or two of mine. So it's easy. I mean, they've made. They've taken the idea, they made a B-29 game. I think they reprinted this That's, under something. Uh, Steve Dixon, I believe, uh, did B-29, the B-29 Korea, and he's, I don't know if it's released yet, but Bombs Away. Yeah, that's um, the one. Is, uh, and they were looking at a retitle, so I'm hoping I'm not. Uh, Bombs Away may have been the original. Are they calling it maybe the Mighty? I can't remember. It's gone through it's a... It's not Target for today, is it? That's what I was wondering. I think it was called Target for today. Well, I don't know. I don't know. They, they, I there was a name change. I'll throw that up in post too, because I remember thinking, why did they change okay. the name? There's a lot of guys. I think on Target there. for today was the original name, and okay. now it's bombs away. I know there is a Target for today. There's a. I'm okay. on the Solitaire Facebook right. War Gamers group, and that's been getting a lot of talk lately. So I didn't know if it was supposed to be this game redone. But it is. Anyway, if there is another reprint, we'll drive the price of this down if you want this. So I think last time I looked a few years, a couple years ago, it was like, you could probably get it for about 50 to 60 bucks. It in may the secondary drive it down. Um, yeah. uh, what what, what Steve way Dixon Washington does is, is yeah. um, and what the criticism has always been, is that this is not, it's definitely not a simulation of the mm -hmm. bomber because what one plane will go through I mean, it, it's a, it's more of a sampling of what all the planes had the potential to have happen to them. Um, and so in that, it loses its realism, uh, but it, and it imparts, in my mind, the narrative. And as a kid, as a 13-year-old kid playing, it gave me the perspective of what the bomber crews as a whole, whether it was the 8th Air Force or, or the 15th or whatever, what they went through. But it's not the most realistic. Um, uh, Dixon works in a lot more of the mechanical uh, issues, weather issues, finding the target, secondary target, and okay. all that. If you um, want to see the power of the narrative of this, go out to YouTube, look for the word Stuka Joe B-17. Mm -hmm. All of us have been on board of Love his Stuka. airplanes. Yeah. Um, and it's it just shows you just the power of where the game's thrill lies. So that's my number two, B-17. And the other thing, um, I mentioned it before, but that's another game that there's a tournament, even though it's a solitaire game, there's a tournament that occurs every year at the World Board Gaming Championships. I don't know the exact count, but it's dozens of people spend an entire day flying. You know, the the people who do run the tournament spend a lot of time finding historical missions, planning. You know, some of the 
random events that will happen so that they occur kind of historically and they fly they try to come back um, it's it's still a huge social thing at the world board gaming championships the one time i went to the wbc i played in that mm -hmm. um the it's got a, a role-playing-esque feel to it mm -hmm. um they they also the guys that had been in it for years they kind of were wondering you know hey we've I, I can't remember what year we've moved into but we've moved into late 43 or right. are we going to be hitting you know whatever right. you know is a big week right uh, it, it evolves yes yeah, so it and evolves I know there year was, to year so they do three missions mm -hmm. they take the day they do three missions a day and the tournament has been going on long enough that it was a few years ago when they did their 50th mission mm. and so they asked me and I made a bunch of uh, buttons for their 50 mission crush it's, so, it's it is sweet yeah, they it's big they uh, they then have an after action thing sometimes at a the next day yeah and, and they'll they'll I think they imagine they you're usually a have a lot of stats for which yes. teams did well which yeah. teams did bad which, which individuals did good yeah. which individuals did bad they'll hand and they even medals. have uh, the medals they have uh, basically a gift exchange mm -hmm. you know of of aircraft related stuff i know i have contributed to that in the past yes so yeah and then they have the mug i can't remember the name of it yeah the, but in uh in um oh, 12 o'clock high and in real life when it was when you were going to have a mission the next day the right. guy would be turned around and then right. the guys knew they couldn't drink past right. midnight or whatever right. and they'll do that mm -hmm. so it's just got a lot of flavor to it right and if you want to play on board game geek look up the game go to the forums i think that's where you always find them uh, i think the guy coordinates and i wish i'd wrote it in i think his name's ian and he has an avatar with a whole bunch of happy faces mm -hmm. right sure. he just might just be a they big player on there. but yeah it's that's where you go to find them okay number one Cool. My number one is probably out there. This is Wings for the Baron. Hmm. This is a game where instead of flying, instead of attacking, what you are is you are a German aircraft manufacturer during World War I. The reason why I picked it as number one is right now this is a very hot game in our game group. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost one of the two or three go-to games. You are uh Fokker, you are Halberstadt, you are false you, you can be it's up to five players and what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh through the use of cards that give you technologies and espionage on your other players you're trying to advance the technology on your fighters on your bombers on your recon aircraft so that you can get more contracts from the government this is this is basically you're you're trying to get money but part of it is you're trying to survive you're you're trying to get money before the war ends usually the germans will lose a war it has occasionally happened where the germans win the war because the allied morale of trying to fight out in the trenches goes down quicker than your morale which can be affected by how advanced the german airplanes are if the german airplanes stay better than the british air than the allied airplanes then the allied morale goes down quicker but the whole time you're also worried about the german economy because uh if the economy tanks all of your paper marks become worthless so one of the actions it's a uh, action point your action selection game you can uh, try to do espionage improve your technology research to get more technology or you can go to the bank to convert your paper money into gold which doesn't lose value at the end of the war and there are a few uh, just enough I'm not a big fan of take that in games, but there are there are just enough take that so that you know um, there is a way to uh, hurt the leader. Hmm. So that's good. So this, like I said, it it plays pretty quickly, hour and a half, uh, maybe two hours, because the war will end pretty you know eventually. But it gets a lot of play in ours. Um, 
I saw it a couple years ago at BGGCon. This is from Victory Point Games. This is a second edition. And they were running a demo in the vendor area. Victory Point was running a demo. And I walked behind and I thought, what is this? And then they said, oh, we've got a seat. Why don't you sit down? And I'm not normally an impulsive buyer, but <laughs> I sat through about three turns of this and it was like, okay, I need to get a copy of this right now. I remember you talking about it yeah. at, at BGG and, and the excitement which, which was there for you. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say, this theme, the idea, the concept is so novel and unique. I mean, just the concept that you're going to be developing and building because mm -hmm. that was a huge innovative time for for aircraft mm -hmm. right. I mean, one thing that right. war does is right. drive innovation right so wings for the baron my number one air war game and you were very excited i wonder what yours is yeah i know but there's going to be a few caveats so b17 queen of the skies um so first <clears throat> you guys some of you know my history the the playing of the game is a narrative arc story. Um, I bought this when I was 13, 1983. It's the game that ushers me into board gaming, the deeper hobby, not just Risk, not just Stratego. Um, and it tells narrative arcs to the extent, uh, two things. One, my parents would come down on a Saturday and kind of check on me because I hadn't left my room. I had a... I had uh, chairs like these, the card table in there, and this game was running and running and running. I created, um, I think, 150 planes. Um, I had them all named. I had them crewed. I had notebooks with um, spare names for when people were wounded. I'm peeling through phone books. I'm, I'm randomly getting names written in. I'm you know wounded. Guys are getting medals. I'm flying missions where I'm flying 75 plane missions, which means I'm that got pretty boring. I played the same flight with the same conditions 75 times, of course, with different planes. But you memorized every chart in the Yeah, I had world. it down. I had it down. Once you drop your bombs, you're halfway there, literally, and you're not going to explode in the middle of uh, over uh, Germany. So. Um, still love the game. I did even get on and play with uh, a squadron. There were squadrons that created, and I and I joined it. And you would get your mission fly. You had a week to fly your mission and send in your results. They would send you back the whole group's results. You would see, oh, my buddy's plane got shot down or whatnot. That was fun too. So recently, my son uh, is ten. Bo, he's he's really enjoying games. He's become my main gaming partner. Um, and I said, you've got to try this. We, we pulled out blank sheets. He put his buddies in the different parts of the plane. I thought that's going to get him. We flew. I, I think we went. It wasn't exactly a milk run, but it wasn't too far. It might even been St. Nazarene or Nazir. I can never say it right. We come back. We play. And I go, what would you think? He, nah. So, eh. But here's what i got to admit is I played it. It just doesn't have the spark for me. Uh, I always thought I still have all my, my squadron and all that stuff, and I, I've always had this image that when I'm real old and like 60, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Or 65. Totally teasing. Or 65. Totally teasing. Now, not that. 60, 65. <laughs> that, I would, that I would go back and play it. I got to admit, um, I don't know if this will stay on my number one uh, even Air War game for much longer. Just us diving back in and me look, thinking, you know, I've never even played this new version of RAF and played the German side. And I'm going to be diving back in and seeing um, if something else, because you've said this for a long time, so have everybody else. The narrative's there, but it's not, it's an experience. It's not necessarily a, it's not a tactical decision war game that's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I didn't even realize it in the 80s when I was playing it. Then I saw that and I thought, you know, they are right. You don't make any decisions other than who to aim your gun at. Right. And that, that is and always the issues. It, it, it's done wonderful things for me personally. I'll, it'll always have a fond area in my heart. And I'll never get rid of it. And maybe when I'm 60, I'll, I'll go back and play it in my old age. <laughs> or 65. <laughs> You're up, brother. All righty. My number one. Ooh. 
is Dawn Patrol from 1982 by TSR. It was an update of an old game called Fight in the, in the Skies. skies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from 1966. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about it until I did a little more research on this. Mm -hmm. um, I've had this game since probably 1984 yeah, so when I got it. Um, like the game because it hits the, it for me personally, it hits the balance of detail without going overboard. Um, my friend Aaron played Air War Tactical Combat, spent like six hours to move six seconds. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I know the laws of thermodynamics, but I don't want to play them in a jet game. I mean, that's why I had homework back in the day. Um, so this does have the third dimension in it, and it does it in a fairly easy way without going overboard. Uh, square grid map, but you can turn your airplanes to the corner, so you have eight directions. Um, the mass easy, um, every 10 miles is a square, so 100 miles, you're moving 10 squares, 100 miles per hour. Um, there's, uh, I wrote, I think I wrote it down, how many, I, or, no I didn't last night, um, I, I counted them up. I thought it was 30 different airplanes in this thing. They all have their cards with all their information. Um, it is the, the top speed, the ceiling, how they climb, how they dive, their armament, things like this. You take your, pot, your, your log sheet, you jot it all down there and you go at it. You can play up to 12 players in this. Um, this game, interesting enough, I, I read, was has been it's the only game that's been played at every single Gen Con. Um, so it still has a following. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's ways you could probably make it a little more realistic, maybe more of an impulse system moving, but it, there comes a point where you go overboard in these games and they become unplayable and they're not, or they just lose all their fun factor. And this hit the right level um, more beef than Rick Dovin's War, um, more beef than the Ace of Aces game. It has a third dimension, but it doesn't go insane with it. It does have a lot of charts, but it's not an unwieldy amount of charts. Um, so anyways, um, and that's, it's just, like I said, it always hit that perfect spot for me. So that's, and I just love the dog fight. I like to pretend I'm wearing the old helmet and the goggles and the scarf, and or I'm Snoopy and the Red Baron. I mean, it's just that whole, you know, that whole romantic vision in your head when I used to play this. So, uh, anyways, um, that's my number one, Dawn Patrol. All right. Cool. Any of you played it before? Uh, not Dawn. I had fight, fight in the skies. The thing I noticed looking on the back, because I, you know, before you said it, I wasn't sure what I remembered about fight in the skies was the square grid, but then the fight in the skies, at least the version I had, just had a whiteboard with the square grid on it. I see that that has some ground mm -hmm. effect uh, underlay on the map so you feel like you're flying over something whereas in fight in the sky you just feel like you're flying in the sky yeah once in a while there will be a ground target out there oh but there's something else in this game and i never did this but it's there i think the idea is cool that's i'm not the only one i've seen i've seen people echo it this is tsr this is the 1980s role playing they do have a campaign role-playing game factor where, with your pilot. The more missions you survive, the more skills you get. It will add an advantage. Cool idea. I never applied it myself because I just always did one-on-one -on -one battles where I'd play solitaire and play all sides. Or you'd get shot down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but anyways, that idea is there. If you like that, that's pretty We cool. need to play it. You saw my old copy over there that I actually had never played, right. but I'd heard it was interesting and I sourced it. Yeah, when back in the a 80s when I ago. saw this, until the box is banged up, it's been through a lot. I, again, I think you're rough on games. It wasn't the 80s. <laughs> you see Starfleet Battles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I sit in the store and I, just, I love the cover art. Just looked at it and looked at it. And I was so anti role playing game. All my friends were Dungeons and Dragons, and I just wouldn't. <laughs> War game. Um, so I was always hesitant about the role playing, but the thing just fascinated me. When I got it, I was real happy with it, but just kind of the spite of me, I want to do the role playing game. You call them uh, role gomers or something? <laughs> I, don't know. I, I blew that even. All right. All right. Ham time. We're here. We're <laughs> we'll right. back. Yes, we got another one coming. See you guys. We're out of here.